Welcome to the jewelry journey, exploring the hidden world of art around you. Because every piece of art has a story, and jewelry is no exception. Welcome back to the jewelry journey. Today, I'm delighted to have two fabulous guests. We'll be talking with Saudia Young. First of all, Saudia is Kara Kroninger's daughter. Kara, you'll learn all about her jewelry and see fabulous examples. And I have to admit that I'm only recently become um, enamored and familiar with her work. She was a real pioneer. And Lisa Berman, no relation, is the one. She, Lisa owns Sculpture to Wear, a gallery in Santa Monica for 10 plus years. And Lisa is the one who introduced us to Kara. So I'm gonna let Lisa tell, tell, give us a little background on that. Lisa? Thank you, Sharon. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here and to meet with your audience and explore art jewelry. It's really my passion. So um, even before I had an opportunity to show Kara's work in my gallery, Sculpture to Wear, I was introduced to her work and saw her work via Artware and uh, in New York, and we'll get into that later, I know Saudia will. And her work was really the catalyst for me to begin to explore my use in resins and acrylics and working with plastics. And so she was really the catalyst for me to get so excited about an art jewelry presence that wasn't metal. I mean, I love the color, I love the texture that she used. And the fact is she was using an everyday material. Um, so when I had my gallery and I was in Bergamot Station and Saudia contacted me, I was really delighted. Um, so Lisa, you mentioned Bergamot Station and you've mentioned it in, in several conversations and I'm, I live down the street from it, so I know what it is, but most people would not know what you're talking about, even, even people who live around the corner. So tell us about it, please. It, it was created almost 27 years ago. It's a five acre complex. It used to be home to about 25 galleries and the Santa Monica Museum of Art. It's at um, the Cloverfield off-ramp at the 10 freeway. And it has a, a fantastic art scene in Santa Monica. And that's where I opened my gallery in January of 1999. And that's exactly how we met. And it's uh, made of old railroad cars, is that it? Yes, well actually it was um, a railroad station, but also uh, it had an ice manufacturing plant, which I didn't know. Yeah. So all of those old structures are, they've maintained the exterior of the old warehouses. But of course, when you enter, you see gorgeous galleries a lot of them are built out in in a really enticing way so um that that's where sculpture wear part two um had its first home so thank you for asking okay no that's 27 years ago i think of it as so new but that's uh it's 27. okay so i showed her work probably was maybe 18 years ago would you say sadia um and a few shows and and my gallery manager at the time was a huge huge fan of of her work and literally wore one of Kara's hearts the resin hearts she would wear one to the gallery every single day and i would have to say hey you know there's some other jewelry that you might want to try on throughout the day and sell and she's like no this is what i'd like to wear this is what I, this is my piece you know and that's the way people really feel they're talismans they're there are these these pieces that that they wear every day um, and so that's that's really I think the the legacy too um, not only was she a pioneer but she she has a great following there are these collectors that are literally coming out of the woodworks after seeing you know what we have to offer and um, so recently when Saudi contacted me again um, we met and we said this is a wonderful opportunity to celebrate your mother's legacy and um i'm wearing i just want to i want to tell you all about the piece i'm wearing and, and we'll learn more about it but this is a piece from um one of the artware shows that robert lee morris hosted at his gallery artware in new york city and it was a time when artists weren't mixing precious metals necessarily in a in a contemporary way um, and there was an, a collector who had 24 karat gold leaf and gave him each a box and said, Robert, we want each artist to use this gold in any way possible in the exhibition. And one of the pieces I'm wearing, I'm, I love this piece, is by Kara. 
And, and you can also see it, the gold, I don't know if you can see it here, it comes shining through. And, and when you see this in the sunlight, it is so spectacular. So it's that dichotomy between um, the resin and then the precious gold. And um, I, it is so exciting for me to have, um, to introduce Saudia's uh, mother's work. And Saudia, you are a dynamic and, and happy belated birthday, by the way, dynamic woman um, who is a singer songwriter. And um, she has really an incredible collection to show you today. This is a part of the, I don't know, one of two or three series. So Saudia, I welcome you to the jewelry journey. And I thank you for your mother's generosity of spirit and your ability to present her legacy in such a, a rich way. Thank you. You're Great welcome. intro. <laughs> thank you very much, Lisa. <laughs> You're welcome. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, this is awesome. Thank you, Aaliyah. Um, so the question you sent me wasn't just about the jewelry journey. You were talking about what it was like to grow up with my mom as an artist, right? And what it was like for my sister and I. And that was a very particular, special experience. Um, first of all, my mom is, uh, she was a white girl from Michigan. She came from farm country and she grew up with a big family. She was the littlest, she was the youngest. And she was very precocious and, you know, she was on the cheerleading team and she was in the 4-H club and she had her own little cow and, you know, for each contest, she, she just was always extremely active. And um, so when she finally made her journey to New York and met my dad, who is a black actor, Otis Young, and they created us, he was on his journey of trying to make it in Hollywood, which was difficult. So they were sort of on and off. And pretty much I feel like we had a single mom upbringing. Um, and it was, yes, Bohemian, downtown, we started off in uh, Little Italy, in a, a tiny apartment in Little Italy. And actually that was quite interesting because there was, you know, we were in, in the downtown area, it's the factory area. So it was uh, clothing, manufacturing and uh, dairy, eggs, everything. So you had this sort of mixture of industry. We were always sort of lived around industry. Um, and that feels really special, like something magical. Honestly, it feels like she gave us a magical childhood because of that. We were never sort of in the mainstream, you know? Um, and so in, the, in that house, I remember we found old remnants from like World War II, like fabric and just uh, relics, um, clothing. What are, what are they called? Uh, aprons like cocktail aprons from the 1950s oh. so so i always associate with my mom finding magic things you know um so that was one of our first homes and during that time she was actually doing work in the clock tower uh and that was something that alana heiss who was the director of ps1 sort of commandeered and she brought in these artists who were allowed to have residency in the clock tower. And it was these huge workspaces. I mean, I can't, I was little. So to me, it looked like it was about 10,000 square feet, but it probably was a couple thousand square feet, mm -hmm. you know, that we, that my mom had to herself. And it was in the clock tower. This is where she met another artist who introduced her to plastics. Because before that she had worked only with leather. She was uh, stitching leather, she was painting, painting with acrylics, painting with oils, and um, selling leather pieces that she handmade on the street and in boutiques. And she had done that since I was born. The legend is she was a cocktail waitress where she met my dad, and she got fired, and that was the last job she had. She was like, I'm, I'm not, take this job and shove it. So that was when she started you know, creating these leather pieces that were very influenced by Native American culture and African culture. She did a lot of fringing and beading, beaded stuff. She did obis. She had a really beautiful obi belt that then carried on throughout her, her career for the next 60 years. She would always introduce the obi. 
and later on when she started working with resins she would actually make uh, created belts from resins as well as metals she also worked in metals so uh children ju jewelry journey we had native american friends we had indian friends from new mexico i'm a jean uh and dominique and they did a lot of bead work and my mom had a very intimate close relationship with them and that influenced a lot of her uh earlier work and later work um as children we also made things you know we were very creative we were always making dolls and making jewelry and creating puppets and uh we even had a puppet stage um so i feel like it was more of a storytelling journey like we were just in this world of creating and telling stories yeah and within this childhood she so because my dad wasn't really around a lot she created she built this community around us she built this tribe i like to tell lisa and that included some amazing artists uh like donald barthame the writer he was uh a family friend, you know, that his daughter is one of our best friends. And James Baldwin was my godfather. And Edwin Stratmanis, the painter, childhood friend, uh, Jay Milder, Ben Dolphin. And all of these artists, we we were the the sort of the the Soho art brats. We were the children of these artists. Um, and then Ben Dolphin was a dancer, and he's now a director. He was the first one who introduced me to performance. I started performing with him as a as a dancer and a performing artist. So yeah, the, it was formative years. We thought we could do anything, you know. Um, she basically imbued the power of storytelling in us and basically made us feel like we could write any story. We could we could write our story in any way we wanted to wow it sounds like a it sounds like a really you know it's not a childhood you say oh my god that must be like she was a, a princess but i haven't heard anybody describe their childhood as magical that's really that's really special um yeah so and we'll look at examples of your, your mother's work in at, in a little while, but tell us a little bit about her jewelry. For those who are familiar, tell us about what is it made of. I know they're one of a kind. It's interesting that you say you're around industry because they're not manufactured, right? They're right, yeah. right, yes. I mean, well, when I say, yeah, industry, meaning like in Tribeca, you had these Mack trucks rolling through who were carrying eggs and butter, and, you know? So it was sort of, and the, the streets were cobblestone and, you know, now these are the very rich, exclusive areas. But when we lived there, that was where the artists live who couldn't afford to live in other parts of the city. Um, and that was actually something my mother really embraced that sort of industrial look. Like if you were in her loft, she had um, things that she found on the street from manufacturers that she would use as tables and couches. And um, when she passed, we actually gave away a lot of really beautiful. Um, items like that. She also collected old farm items like a scythe and you know, whatever. So her materials when she first started it was leather and then she met this artist who was working in plastics in the clock tower and she started uh, doing basic work with that and she actually started off doing sculpture. She would uh, buy liquid resin, liquid polyester resin and pigments, powdered pigments um, and then mix together her magic formulations uh, and pour them into makeshift mold. And one of them was light bulb, a light bulb. She would use a light bulb, a dead light bulb, and basically inject the resin into the glass and huh? then break the glass off once it was hardened. And so here's an example. That's gorgeous. So that was one of her earlier pieces, you're saying? Yeah. So she did. Uh, several of those and it's funny because i just googled her because i was like oh my god i have to sound smart talking about my mom uh and i forgot but she was in a artist makes toys show at moma ps1 in 1975 because what i want to focus on now is showing you sort of little sculptures in addition to the jewelry 
you know. And that's where she, so she really did come from sculpture, from being a sculptor and a painter into jewelry. And so literally. many jewelers do, they come from, from sculpture and then segue to jewelry, yes, uh-huh. Yeah. So so then at that so she's she's you know using all kinds of crazy makeshift molds and eventually she started doing the traditional creating a sample out of wax you know and then uh making rubber molds silicone and rubber molds and at, during this process she started going into the jewelry at the same time that she was working with the the liquid polyester resin, she was also, and Lisa's like, she knows all of this. She started working with acrylic, which comes in chunks and uh, sheets of different widths. So depending on how thick the sheet of acrylic is, she would cut it either with a blade or she would cut it with a saw. And um, the acrylic was, she discovered was the best for, I have a little dog in my lap, so that's why. And he's, yeah, he's, sorry, <laughs> I'm going to put him down. Um, the acrylic was the best for the clear work because acrylic doesn't yellow. And if you're pouring uh, polyester resin and you try to make a clear or white, diamond white clear, eventually through the years, it'll yellow. So she learned that luckily early on and started working with the acrylic or the lucite and the issue with acrylic and lucite is it's very hard. It's a really strong, strong, hard material. And it's really very, you have to be very muscular working with it. So with the acrylic, she would saw it, saw whatever shape she wanted or slice, and then she would have to uh, sand it. And an artist early on sold her a glass sanding machine, which is about six feet tall, and it has a band, uh, a band of sandpaper that you can put on different grades of sandpaper on the band and it would have water splashing on it because there's you know plastic is toxic mm -hmm. and the powder would just cover you if you didn't have this water constantly spraying down your work you know as you're working mm -hmm. and when she would work or when her little studio helpers would work we would be all rubbered up in our suits it would look like we're you know getting ready for unfortunately, uh, pandemic, because <laughs> we would have, you know, rubber suits on, a mask, a number 96 mask, you know, you name it, we had it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the acrylic, and then with the acrylic, she would paint one side if she wanted colors. So she would have to get a, a pigment. Uh, and usually those pigments would be, sometimes they would be powder that she would mix in a solvent and then she would paint on the back so that it would basically meld into the piece. Interesting. Um, and with the polyester resin, as I said, she would mix the different colors. So she might have her red here and her yellow here. And then she would pour into the mold. Um, and she was kind of like a mad scientist, you know, because she would, she had this color memory. She was really known for her color memory and the the relationship of the colors that would come out from her work so people have copied her work but it's been really hard to copy that and I'll show you I know you wanted it to be at the end but I'll show you an example now did she sign her work she signed almost everything it's sick right <laughs> yeah what she is known, I know, I mean, she's really known for the translucency and the, you talk about the colors, but the, the way this, the sun hits her work is just, so, uh, it can't be copied. It's just so, it, and it was so different for the time, especially what people thought of as jewelry at the time. So did she sign her work? She signed everything, almost. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of the important pieces she signed. For sure. When you say important, how did she, did she finish a piece and say this is important or was it after? To me, it seems like an important piece you know after it was, you know, sometime after it was done. I think it was the pores, you know. Um, so you saw the light bulb was the black and white pore. That's an extremely popular pore. Um, and this piece that I just showed you. So the, the pores would just be so amazing 
that every single piece out of that pour would sell out and you know um so i think it was the pores that determined that's what robert would go crazy over you know um because robert lee morris uh it was one of her biggest fans and supporters with artware you know the, the so artwork gallery she was selling she was selling originally yeah and it's also this connection to lisa because um art uh Robert and my mom met at the first sculpture to wear mm -hmm. uh, back in the set, back in 74. New York. So it's really awesome that then my mother showed at Lisa sculpture to wear later yeah. on down the road and that now I'm working with Lisa. So, yeah. So what was your role? You just said that sometimes you, you and your sister were enlisted. Yes, my mother had child laborers. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my sister and I. Um, we would do, yeah, we would do basic sanding and polishing, especially if she got a big order, you know. Uh, at one point, she did a show with Kanzai Yamamoto, and, you know, I think we had to do like 100 hearts in five days or something, you know. And she was known for basically figuring out what she wants to do, what she wanted to do, and then finally at the last minute she knows, and so we would all have to go into production to make it happen. Input in terms of like creative or colors. Oh, this would look better as blue or no? No way. Uh uh. No, she was a dictator. Thank God. Um, <laughs> she knew what she wanted. She would. She knew exactly what she wanted. She chose all the colors. She produced, created everything. We would do finishing work. Um, we could work on things like the slice bangles, you know, or that. Those were a little bit tricky because if you took off too much, you ruined it. Or if you, you know, she was always like coaching us to have it be the exact shape that she is projecting. And then she literally would say, okay, that's really nice, but that's you. And you should go to your own line. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, Which is yeah, yeah, but that's, that's totally fine. I mean, you know, yeah, I should. And so, so my look was, different from her look. Her look was very sensuous and um and when it was faceted it was it was the Kara Kroninger look, you know. So yeah, no, we did not have influence on her. <laughs> Except just being her beautiful little brown girls and maybe we influenced her in that way, uh -huh. you know, spiritually or something, but um not in terms of colors or shapes or anything. So was she, at the time, did, were you aware that she was a pioneer, that she was doing something different? Were you, was like, hey, this is... I think we thought because we were amongst so many artists, amazing people, that we just thought that was the world. We thought everybody's parents are creative, you know? <laughs> so I don't think, um, yeah, I, 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 I knew that she was, in very had a very independent soul and um and that we were sort of isolated in a way that other kids might not have been you know um so yeah i said i wasn't i didn't, wasn't thinking my mom's a pioneer you know <laughs> Isolated because you had a different atmosphere you were growing up in, or I want to say isolated. Yeah, because we're we were often um, with her. You know, when she was doing her work, we would be with her. Um, and how can I explain it? So she wasn't a soccer mom. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? She was. Yeah. She was always in her work. So we were in her world. So we were always in that art world which in a way is a little isolated because artists the good ones are always working mm -hmm. you know so um so that's why i think we became storytellers ourselves because what else were we supposed to do if we're sitting in the, the studio in the clock tower is put on your roller skates roll around you know create plays go visit the artists in each studio so when you say the clock, the clock, I'm not a New Yorker. The clock tower, I, I take it, is uh, it was like a, I'm thinking of a place in, in San Francisco where it was full of I can't I I don't know if the the building has a name, but it, 
artist lofts, basically. Is that what it was? The yeah, it was a municipal building. It, it still exists. It's a huge building in downtown uh, Manhattan on Broadway and Leonard Street. And it had a clock tower on the top. And somehow it was relegated to um, being art. I don't know if there was other parts of it that were still being used as, as municipal offices, but all of the top floors were studios for artists and you would get a residency and be able to work there for, I guess, practically free for a certain amount of time. Um, so yeah, so that's what it was, became an artist residency. So how did this free environment or this innovative creative environment in, influence who you are as a, in your music today? How did, I mean, do you think you would be doing it differently or how, how did it, how did it influence who you are today? Um, I think it, it influenced me in, as I said, is that I, I see everything as a story. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it just really excites me. Uh, whether it's historic, whether it's real, you know, like what we're going through right now with uh, George Floyd and this, my God, we're all living through a real, you know, really serious change in our country. So that, or or just telling a story, the story of the little prince, that was one of the, our favorites for her to read to us. Um, that energy, that storytelling energy and curiosity, I think has carried through and into my work as a singer and an actress and a, and a writer. So definitely, she's totally with me. She completely influenced me, her and my dad, because he also was a storyteller. Interesting. Oh, well, we'd love to hear the stories behind that and see what kind of the jewelry, see the, some of the pieces that you think are just, re that represent her, that are your favorites, or that, you know, do tell a story. Yeah. Her stuff. Um, you'd, so you have some pieces that you want to show us, I think. In addition to what I've just shown, um, here's one piece. As I said, she started off doing more sculpture. This is actually me. This is a portrait that I'm guessing she carved it out of uh, wax or clay. Um, and what else can I show you? Here's another piece. It's a fetish. And she did a little fetish series, fetish sculptures. Is there something inside there or is it just the color that we're seeing inside there? It's the color, yeah. But Sharon, can you see that it's wrapped with, there's cord wrapped and there's a little tiny piece, very mm -hmm. similar to the fetishes that you would see um, in Native American jewelry. I guess he's a bear. That's beautiful. And then behind me you have this, this is a silk scarf she painted on silk. And that's from 1980. And this sculpture right here, can you see that? That's a fish, fish fetish sculpture. That's polyester resin. And this is uh, just twine, dyed twine on wood, on a wood. So did she sell her scarves? I'm just curious. Was, was, did, or yes. She, was the one yeah, did she did. sold her scarves. Yeah, she sold them in artware and a couple other galleries. Wow, those must really be collector. I mean, they're all collector's items, but those must really be collector's items. I mean, she probably- And then I just, oh, let's look at this. Uh, fabulous colors. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I decided to focus on the more sculptural stuff for you all because Lisa has a lot of the jewelry, you know what I mean? This is wearable art, but this to me really um, is something that should be hung up on a wall. <laughs> well, now, if we, okay. Tell us about the necklace, I mean, which, which is like, can be worn, it could be hung on a wall, it could be worn. Yeah, this could be hung on a wall, this could be worn. This is actually, a smaller one of her, I mean, her necklaces can be huge and the beads can be huge. And you asked, you know, did we assist her? So we assisted in things that were the classics, the classic basics like hearts and bangles, but beads, 
she always did the beads. Anything, you know, um, all of the polyester resin bangles, she did herself. The acrylic that had sort of a, a standard shape, then we could work on those. Really beautiful. And the, these are really rare, actually. I don't think there's any other necklace with this shape bead. Wow. Oh. Usually her beads were round, and this is more going towards the an egg shape. Mm -hmm. Did she have the color scheme in mind before she started out? I mean, did she think, okay, I'm going to do what I want to really put red, white, and blue together or whatever, pink and purple. Did she have that in mind, or was it just the way it came out? No, I mean, I think she she definitely had a color palette in mind before she would pour, you know? Um, you know, of course, then because it's viscous or whatever, the material would also do what it wants. Like she would guide it to a certain extent, but also it would sort of, when colors would blend, you know, sometimes surprises, or often surprises would happen. Yeah, no, nice surprises it looks like. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the black and white is sort of, that's that's an obvious basic, you know, um, result, but the others, yeah, that's like, that's, that's pretty crazy. Oh yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Can I add, Saudi, yeah. if I add about this? So yes. what Kara was doing essentially is she was painting and sculpting simultaneously because she had this mold, which is three dimensional and she's adding this color. So it was the sculptural painting that was evolving. And then in essence, while it was in the mold, she would let it be, so to speak, you know? And then, and then when it came out of the mold, there was that second phase, or I don't know what phase it was really, where she gave it life to the, the shape. She would have the color and the posturing in the mold, but the way she finished it. Um, and that's, I think, the use of the material is something that a lot of people are not quite familiar with. You know, they think of sculptors as just bronze or, um, and each one of these, it's very important to understand that every single bead that Saudia was showing you literally is worthy of having her signature on it. Mm -hmm. It is hand sculpted, it is hand carved, it is hand shaped. And even the earrings that I put on during this time, these are all, they're hand poured, they're sliced, they're made. Um, for me, it's very exciting to see this. And again, you're wearing a sculptural painting. Each of her jewelry pieces are sculptural paintings, so to speak, or a painting that is a sculpture. I mean, it's hard to, to you know, intertwine them, but that's really the essence. I really wanted people to understand um, that aspect of it. I think it's it's also really important to understand that nobody else was doing it then. Today, we sort of think, oh yeah, it's, you know, Lucite or whatever, but that it was just so new at the time and so so innovative. I think that's that's you know if I, if we saw a piece today, it might not catch our eye in many ways, just because we might think, oh, we you know, seen a dozen of them, but not realizing that these were hand done and that sort of hand carved and that sort of thing. And, and of course, Saudia can speak to this further, and I, I definitely would like her to. But as a curator and seeing work. Uh, for so many decades, it's important for m my role as a curator and as an educator of studio jewelry is to tell the audience about her work and to, uh, for them to gain a better understanding of the pieces that you're seeing nowadays. Kara's work was the catalyst. It had never been seen before. Like, and you know, Robert wrote Lee Morris's enthusiasm for her work is palpable as well. So that's why it's important to tell her story as a sculptor and Saudi, I had no idea about her show in 1975 at PS1. That is, that just says it all. I mean, right there, that is fantastic. Well, for us down New York, New York is on PS1. Is that public? It's a public school. What is PS1? It's a public school. I, I PS1 was an art institution, still is an art institution, um, founded by Alana Heiss, who was a good friend of my mom's, and she actually brought her into that show and she brought her into the clock tower because she also 
was coordinating the clock tower. She was a mover and a shaker in the art scene. So it says, PS1, one of the largest art institutions in the United States, dedicated solely to contemporary art. It is located in Long Island City, in the Long Island City neighborhood, um, a borough of Queens, New York. So, and it's still, it's still in existence. It's, it was founded in 1971. Interesting. So, so they do performance, they do visual, all types of work there. Wow, I, I, and that's interesting. I guess I know PS is often public school in, in, in many nomenclatures, so I was going, what does that have to do with it? Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. So tell, tell us what your plans are to carry on her legacy. Well, my plans are to continue making reconnections with people like Lisa, uh, amazing movers and shakers, to try to. Um, secure a retrospective of her work, which includes her sculpture and, and her jewelry, uh, to get a book, some type of published entity, a book I, I would love to see, a coffee table book uh, catalog. Um, somehow give her a home, you know, give the work a home where people can enjoy it and see it. I really don't want it to be hidden away in storage or something. You know, her work is very, as Lisa said, it's very sensual. It's, uh, it's, it's spiritual. People love to feel it, to wear it, to hold it, to collect it. Mm -hmm. um, this ring is a bronze archer ring. And, you know, I'm not gonna start producing work or anything it's basically the work that she made is that's it that's what's available so there's a certain percentage of it i'm trying to figure that out with lisa actually what percentage can still be sold um but my dream yeah is to have a home for the work you know uh one of my favorite one of her favorite artists and one of my favorite artists isamo noguchi you know he has this little museum in long island city and it's this sort of Noguchi land where you can go into the sculpture garden and see his huge works and then you can go inside and see his tables and his lamps and the, so that's my dream that somehow I don't know where when or why that she would be housed where people can really see the full dynamic of, of all of her work and also be able to touch it and buy it. What what else before we close? What else would you like us to know about her work or, or or your plans or? Well, she would definitely be in the Black Lives Matter march. She was very political. She was really political. So was my father. She was such a humanist, such a wonderful, wonderful woman, and really loved. Um, so I'm really glad that you're giving me this opportunity to, you know, continue to to put her. Her work out there but yeah she just I think she would be really happy with what's happening in terms of everybody coming together this sort of multiracial unity behind humanity so yeah okay well, uh, well I'm glad that we're giving her you know more people have the opportunity to learn about her work and what kind of innovator she was and your role in it and the i mean i just can't even imagine what kind of life you lived or you, you i know that right now you have a very fluid sort of life you're in connecticut new york going back to germany then you know hopping around the world um anyway thank you so much for being with us today and to everybody listening this has been the jewelry journey and please if you like us review us and you can download us wherever you, you download your podcast and we'll be back next time with another fabulous interesting guest in the world of jewelry. Thank you so much. Thank you again for listening. Please leave us a rating and review so we can help others start their own jewelry journey.